All right, folks, good morning. It's July 18th, 2023, and we're going to be talking in this episode about U.S. banks and institutions getting ready to use XRP. Now, this isn't clickbait coming from me. It was a statement coming from General Counsel of Ripple, Stuart Alderati, got shared on a CNBC article yesterday after they got his comments on this most recent ruling uh, that we got from Judge Torres. Huge victory for the XRP community. The party is still going on, and I appreciate you guys for stopping by to celebrate with me. We're going to get right on into it. Okay, uh, right now we're looking at this market. Actually did turn back down this morning. We take a look here. Bitcoin back down to 29,800 and, uh, sorry, 780 or no, 8, 850. Yeah, 29,850 at the time of this recording, almost 7 a.m. on the West Coast here, July 18th, 2023. 1895 for your Ethereum and XRP is at 75.91. So XRP is holding strong, but Bit Bitcoin did take another dip. Now, yesterday I reported how Bitcoin actually went below uh, my Bitcoin short, went back into profit there for a little bit. And then we did the same thing this morning. And we're watching this thing closely. It's teetering on the edge. And I am expecting some more volatility to finish out the rest of this week. So stay safe out there, folks. Now, let's get right on into the update. I appreciate everyone for tuning in. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell. And if you need to get in touch with us or get tapped in with our community of like-minded individuals who are going to take advantage of this opportunity, head on over to my website, zachrector.com. Now we take a look here. So we have this $75 trillion transfer of wealth. I dropped the video this morning. You guys probably already saw it, but we're talking about the baby boomers owning 75 trillion in stocks, homes, and businesses. Now, Rosie Rios, comments on intergenerational wealth transfer someone who's been talking about xrp uh, obviously came to be board of directors at ripple 43rd treasurer of the united states the trillion dollar woman let's hear what she has to say on this transfer of wealth let's take a listen when you think about the intergenerational wealth transfer that's going to go on what do you think about yeah well first of all thanks for having me and if you're only thinking about it now you're behind the eight ball. Mm -hmm. The train has left the station. I mm -hmm. keep saying that, and it's absolutely true, especially when it comes to this topic. So what people need to realize about intergenerational wealth is it's already happening, right? So we're talking about kind of, so, so the boomers, which is my generation, mm -hmm. you know, we, we have the most discretionary income. But this next generation, basically, you know, the millennials, although it, it's, it's pretty much anyone born in the mid-90s and okay. later, uh, you know, are, are going to inherit this this opportunity to really think about investments in a totally different way. So when you think about those generations, so technically, you know, the millennials or anyone born between 1980 and 1996. Mm -hmm. But again, look, my son's 26, my daughter's 21. I call them the Robin Hood investor, right? Mm -hmm. But in reality, you know, these are kids who grew up with the internet, right? So anyone who's grown up with the internet, they see the world as very flat. It's no longer what they're taught at home, what they're taught in the classroom. It's what they see. It's what they've learned. The good, the bad, and the ugly of the internet. They're very tech savvy. They're very confident. But they don't have the experience that perhaps a lot of wealth managers, financial analysts, managers, et cetera, need to really understand how to think about their investments. So for me, you know, it was very important that I get into their heads. My daughter's 21. My son is 26. When I left the Obama administration in 2016, after serving both terms, I studied these kids. I call them kids for two years at Harvard, and I really want to understand kind of the social, political, economic way that they think and how they behave. And for them, you know, it's kind of this one and done world, right? It's, it's set it and forget it. Right. Technology means everything to them. They're very, very confident. They're very progressive, and they're very savvy. But again, they lack a lot of the world experience that my generation still has. So even here now in this economic downturn, this unprecedented economic downturn, this is where, in my opinion, the wealth management industry has a huge opportunity. It's no longer about taking them out to golf and buying them dinner. It's really kind of thinking about how to use technology and information in a totally different way. So if you're not already on their app, on their phone, and that's how they access information, if you're not already there, you know, you're behind. You're behind. So there you have it, folks. If you're not already on it, the train has left the station and you are behind. Now, thankfully for us, we've been tapped in. And Rosie Rios just re, you know, um, reinforcing kind of our main thesis that this thing's already underway. They've already been working on this thing for a while. She's someone from the older generation that gets it and is working with the young folks to help implement this. And something that my mentor, Dan Pena, talked about with the transfer of wealth that's underway right now is how these younger generations 
excuse me, now are managing most of the money. Most of the money that is being managed right now is by millennials, if I'm not mistaken. And so not only do the baby boomers have a lot of wealth to give to us, you already have the millennial generation, my generation, that is already managing so much of the money. Now, the scary thing about this is, <clears throat> you know, I wasn't in the markets and many millennials weren't in the markets participating during the last great financial crisis. So for a lot of us young folks, all we've seen is upside. And then we, you know, we understand the tech, we know how to be Robin Hood traders, but all we've seen is upside. And so that's the experience that I seek out with my professionals, with my dream team, with the people that I surround myself with, with my discord community are folks that are baby boomers with tons of experience, right? And I think that uh, the combination of the two uh, gets really dynamic for investing. And so that's what I've been taking advantage of right now is tapping folks in my community who bring serious experience to the table. Now, with that being said, guys, let's get right on into the crypto update. We got a lot to cover. We did get an update on the case yesterday. Judge Sarah Netburn orders both Ripple and the SEC to agree on three mutually convenient dates to settle uh, to schedule a settlement conference if they believe it to be productive at this time. She also recommends scheduling six to eight weeks beforehand due to the court's busy schedule. So we're gonna see, this is basically just procedures guys, but we're gonna see if we end up getting that settlement for sure, very interesting. Now, here is the first comments I believe that we get from Gary Gensler post SEC loss. So let's see how good guy Gary Gensler handled this one. How does the federal court ruling last week in the Ripple case impact your stance toward digital asset regulation? Does it inject urgency into the need for federal legislation to clarify regulatory in oversight of this industry? Um, look, our, our mission is, remains exactly what I spoke about earlier, about investor protection, promoting capital formation, and the markets in the middle. Um, this is a recent decision, just a handful of days ago. Uh, we were uh, pleased uh, from that decision, recognizing uh, the importance of protecting investors on the institutional investors uh, in that, uh, and that the court uh, um, uh, movement with regard to um, fair notice, uh, and while disappointed on what they said about retail investors, uh, we're still uh, looking at it and, and assessing that opinion. So they haven't accepted their loss, in other words, right? And you can just sense the, I mean, you can just see the weakness in this guy. Now, folks, remember, this is, this is who we're up against. A lot of these guys are just so pathetic, right? I, I, I mean, I mean, you tap them and these guys would push over. They're so weak as he sits there looking like some sort of alien reptilian creature. He's such a weird looking dude. Um, they're not ready to take this loss. They're obviously cheering on, you know, being able to protect the institutions, but sad that they can't protect retail. It's an absolute joke. But then again, he was, you know, making the rounds, I guess, yesterday. He felt comfortable enough to show himself. And so we got a couple of softball questions. So here he is on Yahoo Finance. And let's see what he has to say here. Kind of a similar answer. Switching gears, I want to ask you about crypto. There you go. You, you, you didn't think I was going to let you off the hook, Chair Gensler, did you? <laughs> All right. So last week we got a major ruling from the Southern District of New York on Ripple. How does this ruling change your approach, if at all, your abilities when it comes to regulating crypto and specifically crypto exchanges? Look, our approach has been the same. It's about protecting investors, facilitating those who want to raise money, and the markets in the middle. And uh, that's true whether it's in other parts of the securities markets or the parts of the crypto markets that are securities. And in terms of uh, the decision, we're, we're still taking a look at it. We're pleased with how the courts addressed itself to uh, that, that a token for institutional investors uh, is a security, uh, how they address themselves to a fair notice, disappointed in other aspect about retail investors, but we're still taking a, a look at that and considering it. Coin 
he he is wrong uh the token itself is not a security for you know whether it's for investors whether it's for me and you the token in it of itself is not a security so maybe he just misspoke maybe it was an accident or maybe he can't accept the loss but the token is never a security the underlying asset has never been a security it is the investment contract that that asset is put into so gary is wrong in stating that i'm sure it was just a little mishap um, but as you can see, these people running our country are absolutely sick and pathetic at best, weak as hell, corrupt, and they've sold out this whole country. Look at that guy. I mean, he just creeps me out. Gives me the creeps just looking at him, right? But it's pathetic. And it's hilarious the fact that they still don't want to accept this, even though the precedent in these Howey test cases and the securities laws they go back decades and never not once has the oranges been a security has the underlying asset been a security right it is the investment contract why can't gary accept that and he talks about how you know parts of the crypto market where securities uh, laws apply right well we're still yet to see you know to me it's very simple. The underlying asset uh, in and of itself is almost never a security, right? But if you have a scheme, if you have investment contracts, if you have, uh, you know, different types of staking rewards that are based off of the efforts of others, you're pooling your money, expectations of profits, then you can start to hit on some of those Howie Prong tests and you have yourselves a security, right? But uh, obviously, the SEC struggling to take this loss. Good guy Gary Gensler, though, he reiterates how he's just, you know, disappointed that he doesn't get to protect retail, but he's excited that he gets to protect institutional investors. Right? It's 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 just a joke, and they speak to the, the, these people as if we're stupid, as if we don't get it, you know, and that's the disrespectful part. And so, once again, XRP community, we did it. We won, and Judge Torres ruling is the law of the land. And so until they appeal, until they get something different, we know that XRP in and of itself is not a scheme, a security. It is a digital token in the words of Judge Torres, a virtual currency in the words of Finson, and we have been set free. So, you know, no matter how Gary and the SEC are handling this loss, doesn't matter because we have clarity and it's time to start moving ahead with or without them, right? We know what we have and it's time to start building. And I'm just so excited for the XRP community. It's been a long time coming. Now, um, Katie Juan coming on the case. Appeal on recent court decision on XRP seems unlikely. Katie Juan, former U.S. Justice Department prosecutor. Then we get this one from BitTrue regarding XRP shared by Cowboy Crypto. Holdings have increased from under 200 million USDT of XRP to over 800 million USDT of XRP in just the last two days, 88% long. So it looks like on the BitTrue platform, we went from 200 million to 800 million USDT of XRP. That is big. And I did want to make a quick point on that, though, folks, is watch out for your Tether exposure. We know that Tether is depegging on Binance, so watch out for that one. Now we move on over. Ripple Wave 5 XRPL grants had an overwhelming response through a rigorous judging process 10% of projects were awarded more than 1.6 million for their innovative ideas and potential to advance adoption and the utility of the XRP ledger. Now that's what we love to see continuing to develop within this ecosystem. We move on over. Yesterday, there was a Twitter space held by Link2 and Joseph Indoso, COO of Link2. Okay. And, uh, Joe, Joseph Indoso predicts that U.S. banks will begin announcing that they will be using XRP after the SEC settlement, maybe post-judgment, asked Digital Asset Investor, and he specifically names HSBC as a potential international bank that will use it. Now, I'm not going to play this clip. You guys probably already heard it when you watched uh, DAI. Huge shout out to DAI. But what we're talking about here, and uh, it, it's just so incredible to get this statement coming out of Stuart Alderati, the Chief General Counsel of Ripple. So this was the headline from CNBC yesterday. Ripple says U.S. banks will want to use XRP cryptocurrency after partial victory in SEC fight. And so you scroll on down here and you can see here the statement from Stuart Alderati. He says... Asked whether the ruling meant that American banks would return to Ripple to use its ODL product, Alderati said, I think the answer to that is yes. Ripple also uses blockchain in its business to send messages between banks, kind of like a blockchain-based alternative to Swift. Quote, 
I think we're hopeful that this decision would give financial institution customers or potential customers comfort to at least come in and start having the conversation about what problems they are experiencing in their business. Real world problems in terms of moving value across borders without incurring obscene fees. Hopefully this quarter will generate a lot of conversations in the United States with customers, and hopefully some of those conversations will actually turn into real business. So folks, just think about that. I mean, you know, it's it's like uh, these guys just don't come out and say or throw these things around, especially on the legal team, right? And, and you know, Digital Asset Investor in the space yesterday, he prefaced his question for Joe Endoso by saying that a lawyer doesn't put someone up on the stand and ask the question unless they already know the answer. So in this same regard, Stuart al doesn't come out and say this and just throw this out there unless he already knows it's in the works, unless he already knows that deals are already done. And this is what I'm talking about. This is the great unveiling where we lift the veil on all those NDAs, on all those contracts, and then we take it one step further. DEI talks about this post-settlement. He says, the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Wall Street machine is out in full force trying to scare everyone over the Ripple ruling. That should be a tell. And, and they come after what they fear the most, right? And that's why they went after Ripple first, is because Ripple was the biggest threat to the incumbents in the traditional financial space. He says, here's what I'm being told is lo most likely uh, by the good guy legal minds behind the scenes. We are going to get a post-judgment settlement where Ripple agrees to fine, this would give Gary a win he could hold up. Gary most likely wouldn't be there for an appeal. And if we've learned anything about him, it's all about his career advancement. What does Ripple ask for in return? How about a no action letter for their ODL sales? Remember those 1700 contracts, pre-allocated options contracts maybe? I've been told an appeal is too risky for Gary even if he was going to be there to take credit because if he loses, he loses his entire crypto enforcement agenda and the ability to go after any any coin he wants to pick off the fear is real for a reason and you know with the judge now setting the date for settlement talks this thing's starting to move pretty quick now right like this is what we've been waiting for was just that summary judgment order from judge torres we got it it was you know better than we expected um you know, we didn't even know if she was going to touch on the secondary market or sales to exchanges, but she did. And she gave us that clarity that XRP in and of itself is not a scheme or a security. So we are free. And now you are going to see the potential for a settlement where Ripple says, okay, these, these contracts, we understand that they do come into question. They might be a security. So we're just going to cut you the check. You can go tell all your buddies, Gary. Okay. But we're going to need a no action letter on all these 1700 contracts and all the other deals that we don't even know about. And you're going to let us proceed with our business. You're going to allow us to sell off to institutions if we want to come in and report these sales. Or, um, you know, basically they just have to put a middleman in between them and the buyer, right? It has to be a blind bid ask uh, type of agreement. That's why programmatic sales were not ruled as securities, um, you, you know, to exchanges, to other market makers. That's that's the only deal really that's going forward. And I'm not the legal mind, right? But for me, my understanding of this is that basically, as long as Ripple sells off to exchanges, programmatic sales to market makers, then they are going to be good to go. Now, is that going to make it more difficult for institutions to get it because they won't be able to go to Ripple and get a big lump sum at once at a discount? I would speculate that that might be the case, right? Because in the past, you had groups like R3 that went to Ripple and they, they wanted 5 billion XRP and they got Ripple to sign a three-year options contract to buy 5 billion XRP for under a penny. From 2016 to 2019, they had the ability to buy 5 billion XRP for less than a penny. <clears throat> now, the rest is history after XRP went in, in a bull run upwards of 20 cents, and obviously that deal fell apart. And the other thing was R3 lost some of the banks and institutions that were part of their consortium that Ripple wanted to partner up with. So Ripple said, on your end, you guys failed. And then obviously, <laughs> XRP price above 20 cents, kind of, uh, you know, Ripple was taking a massive loss on those XRP. So they ended up suing and they came to a settlement where R3 ended up getting a billion XRP. So this is the type of deal that might not be allowed going forward, but they still, these institutions and banks within the United States are still going to have the ability to get XRP. They're just going to have to go through exchanges, market makers. They won't be able to directly go to Ripple unless Ripple does get that no action letter. And basically they decide to just start reporting these sales and uh, do the deal with the SEC. The other thing that I've considered too is, oh, excuse me, 
outside of the United States, these institutions and banks can come into XRP as well, right? So that part of their business, um, you know, for, for the domestic payment rails, they don't really need XRP, but for cross-border payments, for treasury flows, for other things that they want to use XRP for, they could just acquire XRP outside the United States, right? They, 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 most of these banks have entities, uh, at least the bigger banks, the global banks, have entities outside the United States, or they could partner up with Medico in Switzerland. What Ripple just acquired that custody solution. They could open up an account with Medico, get some XRP over there. So I think that there's going to be a lot of ways for the banks and institutions to get XRP. Right now, all we're waiting for is for that one bank. That one bank that says, yep, we're going to start using XRP. And I think that you're about to see this space go absolutely nuts. Um, and, and so, yeah, watch out for that, folks. This could be coming at any time. This thing's moving quickly. Very exciting. So make sure that you guys have a plan right now. We did a Twitter space on Sunday night about XRP wealth management. What are we going to do after we get these gains on XRP? I got no TA charts for you guys today, but you guys know a lot of people are throwing up TA and uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of folks want to take advantage of the xrp community want to take advantage of the hype so just be aware you're going to see crazy price action we're going to be at a hundred dollars by september we're going to do something by the end of the year i got a new riddle i got a new moon date you know and it's funny because uh riddles are cute and fun but i'm just like bro we got to build we don't have to what are we doing riddles for still like there are literally people still doing riddles and stuff and I, i'm not a hater on that i'm just like dude we, we we got clarity like there's no more we don't got to worry about the next date we don't got to worry about this or that we got to figure out what are we going to build on the xrp ledger how are we going to implement the xrp ledger into our business who can we partner up with to move our business forward and then what are we going to do with the wealth that comes from our crypto gains so whether xrp goes to five bucks or 589 somewhere in between is going to give us life-changing gains are you going to be going into real estate are you going to go into business what is your plan for doing so so if you're looking to get tapped in with our community because that's what we've been discussing on the back end you can head on over to my website zachrector.com you sign up for the patreon to get access to our discord group and we'd love to have you in there because that's what we've been working on every single day guys we're going to continue to press on there's still so much to do here so uh just because we have clarity does not mean that the fight is over does not mean that we are done building we are actually just getting started and so thank you for stopping by here today on the way out if you could please smash that thumbs up for me make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell and we will see you guys in the next one god bless